next video is the next installment of the world's greatest ghosts and we're up to the haunting of Wellington Mill. When Joseph Proctor and his family moved into the mill house in 1835, they paid little attention to rumours that the place was haunted. The house was a pleasant, comparatively new building set by a tidal stream in the Northumberland village of Wellington in England's rugged northeast. The Proctors were a highly respected, devoutly Quaker family. Mr. Proctor was said to be a man of high intelligence and common sense, good and kind to his family and employees. Yet after little more than a decade, the Proctors were driven to leave in distress, unable to stand any more of the weird and ghostly happenings that plagued them from the day they first arrived at Willington Mill. Only much later were they to learn that their house had been built on the site of an old cottage, that a terrible crime had been committed there years before and that a priest had refused to hear the confession of a woman who desperately wanted to unburden her conscience. So prolific was the haunting of Willington Mill while the Proctors lived there that when W.T. Stead, the writer and ghost hunter, first pieced together the story in the 1890s, there were still 40 people alive who had actually seen the ghost. The hauntings began one night in January 1835. A nursemaid was putting the children to bed in the second floor nursery when she heard heavy footsteps coming from a room immediately above. It was an empty room, never used by the family. At first the girl took little notice, thinking it must be one of the handy men with a job to do. But they went on night after night, getting louder and louder. Other servants and members of the family also heard them, but when they burst into the room to surprise the intruder, no one was there. They sprinkled meal over the floor, but there were no footprints. One morning, as Mr. Proctor was conducting family prayers, the heavy steps were heard coming down the stairs, past the parlour and along the hall to the front door. The family heard the bar removed, two bolts drawn back and the lock turned. Mr. Proctor rushed into the hall to find the door open. The footsteps went on down the path. Poor Mrs. Proctor fainted. It became increasingly difficult to get servants to stay in the house. Only one girl, Mary Young, whom the family had brought with them from their previous home in North Shields, loyally refused to leave. There was a period when it seemed as though the whole house had been taken over by unseen people. There were sounds of doors opening, people entering and leaving rooms, thumps and blows and laboured breathing, the steps of a child, chairs being moved and rustling sounds as if a woman in a silk dress was hurrying by. Until a certain whit Monday, the haunting remained entirely by sound. On that day, Mary Young was washing dishes in the kitchen when she heard footsteps in the passage. Looking up, she saw a woman in a lavender silk dress go upstairs and enter one of the rooms. That night, the noises in the house were worse than anybody had heard before. Two of Mrs. Proctor's sisters arrived for a visit. The first night, sleeping together in the same four-poster bed, they felt it lift up. Their first thought was that a thief had hidden there, so they rang the alarm and the men of the house came running. No one was found. On another night, their bed was violently shaken and the curtains suddenly hoisted up, then let down again several times. They had the curtains removed, but the experience that followed was even more terrifying. They lay awake, half expecting something to happen when a misty, bluish figure of a woman drifted out of the wall and leaned over them in an almost horizontal position. Both women saw the figure quite clearly and lay there speechless with terror as it retreated and passed back into the wall. Neither would sleep in the room another night and one of them even left the house to take lodgings with Mill Foreman Thomas Mann and his wife. One dark moonless night, the Manns, their daughter and their visitor were walking past the Mill house after paying a call on neighbours. All four saw the luminous figure of what appeared to be a priest in a surplice gliding back and forth at the height of the second floor. It seemed to go through the wall of the house and stand looking out at the window. The focus of the haunting seemed to be what the Proctors called the Blue Room, and in the summer of 1840 they agreed to allow Edward Drury, who specialised in supernatural investigation, to spend a night there. He took with him a friend who refused to get into bed but dozed off in a chair. Drury later wrote a letter describing what happened. I took out my watch to ascertain the time and found that it wanted ten minutes to one, he said. In taking my eyes off the watch, I became riveted upon a closet door, which I distinctly saw open, and saw also a figure of a female attired in greyish garments, with the head inclining downwards and one hand pressed upon the chest, as if in pain. It advanced with an apparently cautious step, 
across the floor towards me. Immediately approached my friend who was slumbering, its right hand extended toward him. I then rushed at it. It was three hours before a jury could recollect anything more. He had been carried downstairs in a state of terror by Mr. Proctor. Jury had shrieked, there she is, keep her off, for God's sake, keep her off. The grey lady was seen by others. So were unearthly animals and other startling apparitions. The proctors tried to shield their children from the worst of the haunting, but eventually they became involved. One day a daughter told Mary Young, There's a lady sitting on the bed in Mama's room. She has eye holes, but no eyes, and she looked hard at me. Then another daughter reported that in the night a lady had come out of the wall and looked into the mirror. She had eye holes, but no eyes. Another child saw the figure of a man enter his room, push up the sash window, lower it again, then leave. In 1847, Joseph Proctor decided his family could endure no more. They moved away to another part of Northumberland and were never again troubled by ghosts. The house was later divided into two dwellings and eventually deteriorated into a slum. People continued to hear and see strange things from time to time, but Wellington Mill House was never again to know the terrifying days and nights that afflicted the Pierce Quaker family. And that ends that installment for the world's greatest ghosts.